Well, today I'm going to talk just about the ring in general and then begin talking specifically about Das Rheingold uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, not to put too fine a point upon it, the ring is one of the greatest products of the human imagination ever created. I think all of us would agree great in terms of size and length. I can't think of anybody else who has written an opera that lasted anyway any between 14 and 16 hours. I'm sure somebody has, but it does, isn't performed with the regularity that The Ring is. Uh, the Ring is a truly gigantic work, and in this it is actually a very remarkable piece. But also I think it is one of the greatest works of the imag human imagination to the extent that ever since it was written, generation after generation of opera goers and theatre goers have been to the ring and have found in it an extraordinary source of wisdom and an appeal to their imagination. It is not just sort of for sensational reasons that ring cycles are being performed around the world today. It is because they find audiences that find in this work an extraordinary wealth of material and tremendous insights into the human condition. And so we now begin what I think is going to be four years of analyzing this extraordinary work. The Ring is a key work in European culture. And the moment you engage with the ring, you begin to feel that though it was written between 1849 and 1876, somehow it has a much wider span. It seems to look back to the past, and yet at the same time, it seems to look into the future. There's, in fact, a, a really remarkable sort of liminal quality to the ring. It sort of it spans whole generations. It's, in its use of mythology, it looks back to the origins of the European theatre in ancient Athens. And indeed, several scholars have recently seen the ring as being strongly influenced by the great tragic tetralogies of the Festival of Dionysus. And I'm going to talk about those um, as we go through um, the material of this weekend. Um, it looks back to the theatre of ancient Athens. It looks back to the sad Scandinavian sagas and the Germanic epics of the Middle Ages. But also, it looks forward to modern psychological drama. It explores, in terms of music drama, a terrain that in uh, generations following Wagner would be explored by some of the most major um, uh, intellectual writers of, um, of European literature. In particular, the dramas of Ibsen, uh, Chekhov and Strindberg and the great psychological playwrights of the 20th century. In many ways, Wagner's work in the ring anticipates what these playwrights were going to be doing. So it's a Janus faced work. It looks back to the past and it looks forward to the future. And what I hope to do in these talks is to capture something of this, both something of the sort of the, the history from which the ring comes and the modern world that it in fact was describing. And since Wagner's death, it has proved that he described it extremely well, because the reason we keep on going back to the ring is it speaks to us as people who live in the 20th and now, of course, the 21st centuries. And now today, my talk is going to be, I'm not going to look at the music, or indeed at the, much of the drama, but what I want to do is to place the ring in the context of Wagner's time and life. Why did he undertake the composition of such an extraordinary work? And so I really just want to go through the basics, the circumstances in which the ring arose, and then, in a fairly sort of prosaic and factual matter, manner, I just want to go through the stages of composition so we can get some idea of the way in which this work that took, oh, and it took almost three decades to, uh, to, to compose how it was put together. Now let's begin with Wagner himself. Richard Wagner, if this were Theatre 2C at UCSB, which I have just finished, and actually talk about Wagner, I say, Richard Wagner, 1813 to 1818, German composer and music dramatist. But I think, of course, for you, I have to say a little bit more than this. Wagner was an extraordinary polymath. He was a composer. He was a poet, an essayist, a theatre director, 
a journalist, a political theorist, a philosopher, a musicologist, and even in his own particular way, a theatre architect. Though I'm quite sure architects would question whether he actually was an architect or not, but he certainly did design a theatre. Um, he was, on top of all of this, quite simply, one of the most ambitious men who has ever lived. But one thing is, he could never, ever be happy unless he was controlling everybody around him. <laughs> and to put a very negative spin on this, he was a megalomaniac. <laughs> and quite frankly, he was sort of, I think, afraid in some ways of anybody who in some ways would seem to sort of incorporate, sort of, a sort of, sort of tread upon his own terrain. And yet at the same time, he had an extraordinarily rich vision of the world that in many ways sort of artistically justified this. To put this megalomania in more modern and more trivial terms, he was a control freak. He literally, he needed to sort of be in control of the whole world around him. However, to describe his personality in terms that I think he would have approved, I would say that he was an apocalyptic visionary. And it was an apocalyptic vision that he wanted to bring onto the stage, and it is that vision that would then possess the audience that came to see it. Some have seen in Wagner's thoughts and in his career the origins of 20th century totalitarianism. And at times, when we read his essays and when we read his, um, some of his correspondence, we might feel that this is the case. I personally find it is immensely more difficult to prove his totalitarianism from his, uh, his, his dramatic work. But in fact, ultimately, even though he was, at least for some of his life, very fascinated by the political world, ultimately his ambitions were centered upon music and the theater and on revolutionizing the music and the theater. His ambition was to revolutionize the way in which music was composed, theater was produced, and opera was performed. And with the ring cycle, he was successful. He was staggeringly successful. Maybe it might not have seemed to be in 1876 when The Ring was first performed at, uh, at Bayreuth. It was not a perfect production by any manner of means. But certainly if we look at the sort of 140 years history of The Ring since, we can actually see that Wagner was extraordinarily successful in trying to bring about the changes that he wanted to see in the theatre and has been tremendously successful in actually making our own, gen all the generations since, think about their own theatrical and musical activities as well. Um, but success of Wagner meant that he had to invent a theatre that totally possessed the audience. And so in fact, a theatre of audience members who in fact were possessed in the same, the same way that he wished to possess people whom he met in his everyday life. Now, this means that for Wagner, Opera meant we had to grasp the spectator's imagination in the same way that Wagner himself wanted to grasp people's personalities. For Wagner, we should go to the theatre not merely to be entertained. Entertainment is important. Entertainment is always important. If we do not entertain our audiences, we lose our audiences. But basically, he wanted people to go to the theatre to be not only to be entertained, but to be possessed by the work and then transformed by the work. I think that idea of transformation is very important. Um, opera, as Wagner found it when he was a young man, he could not do this. What he had to do was he had to transform opera from, uh, from opera into music drama. Now, when Wagner was growing up during the 1820s and 1830s, by the way, we have here a picture of him as he was, as he began the ring, here we have it as the end of the ring. The whole the sort of experience of 30 years of tor tortured and tormented composition in many ways finds itself in this fascinating face that we have here. But anyway, when he was growing up in the 1820s and the 1830s, Opera was dominated by the bel canto type style of opera that was most associated in Wagner's youth with this gentleman, Giacchino Rossini, 1792 to 1868. Now, on the whole, the operas of Rossini were understood by Wagner, and indeed understood, I think, by many practitioners in the theatre at the time, 
Uh, it was, it, it, opera was, was, was seen as being an art form that centered primarily upon the human voice. It was bel canto opera, and bel canto means beautiful singing. And dramatic values, we are told, were considered to be secondary in bel canto opera. Um, the melodies of bel canto opera were devised primarily to display the agility and grace of the voice, and not really to unfold a dramatic action. Uh, so the voice was considered to be the most important element in any performance. Bel canto opera was primarily a series of formal musical pieces, duets, arias, ensembles, choruses, linked by, uh, by recitative, uh, which until the, sort of the 1810s was, was mainly dry recitative, according to a harpsichord, and then later became accompanied recitative. And uh, bel canto opera was regularly interrupt, inter, inter, interrupted by audience applause. And bel canto opera was performed in this sort of building. Here we have the Teatro La Fenice in Venice in 1837, one of the great uh, centers for bel canto opera. And um, this is not the operatic environment that Wagner admired. Far from it, Wagner would not have been at ease in a building such as this, because this is as much a space for socializing as it is for seeing opera. Social life in the Italian opera house in the 19th century took place in the various boxes that, uh, that, 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 that provided the walls of the theatre. Um, as the Italians tend to entertain more outside the home than inside the home, the opera box was a crucial uh, element, a, a crucial possession of any family that wished to make a social impact on the community of which is a part. So the opera house was there primarily uh, both as a place to display music and also as a place for social life. This was a building in which not only did you listen to music, you mixed with people, you gambled, you ate, you, you flirted, you arranged uh, marriages for your eligible sons and daughters. It was a theatre in which the audience ruled. It was a theatre in which when you were singing, you probably had to compete against a hubbub of conversation that was taking place all around the building. Wagner wanted to change this dynamic. He wanted to change the theatre from an institution where the audience ruled to an institution where the stage ruled and people went to the theatre not to socialise, but went to the theatre to witness the works of art that were to be performed on its stage. And he realised that in order to do this, he had to create a new musical form, a new mode of staging, and even a new theatre architecture, all of which he did in the composition of the ring. And how did he achieve it? Well now, the first thing I think I should say is that the operatic world was not quite as corrupt and as uh, sort of um, artistically bankrupt as Wagner um, uh, perhaps uh, imagined it to be. Like all revolutionaries, Wagner considered that his ideas for change were unique and that the world that he was rebelling against was totally corrupt and he was only going to bring forward the new utopian world that is perfect. This is necessary. In order to be revolutionary, you have to feel that way. But those of us who are not revolutionaries, and can perhaps take a somewhat more philosophical and detached view, actually will realize that some of the reforms that Wagner wanted to introduce were actually already underway in the 1820s. In fact, in the 1820s, there were signs that change was really afoot. Rossini's last operas have long passages of ensemble. They have continuous music. They pay much more attention to the drama than we think his earlier operas do. In fact, if any of you are going to be in Pesaro or going to Bayreuth, you might want to go to Pesaro in the summer to see, oh no, it's not Pesaro, it's next year. You want to go to Santa Fe next year where they're doing Rossini's Malmetta Secondo, which is one of the most fascinating works on sexual obsession. 
uh, that I, uh, I know, and in fact, the, 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 uh, the acts of Mamas are constructed in very, very long units. You do not have the sort of the arias and the, uh, the recitative breakdown that is common in often this time. In fact, Rossini in the 1920s, the uh, 1820s, was really beginning to sort of move toward a sort of a more continuous style of opera. Indeed, we might almost argue that Rossini earlier on in works such as the Barbara Seville did in fact observe dramatic values. It's just that conventions were very, very different in those days. Um, but anyway, the pattern of musical pieces linked by recitative was beginning to break down before Wagner even began to start composing. In Germany, there were signs of change when he was a young man as well. In particular, in operas such as those by Carl Maria, uh, Maria von Weber, uh, Carl Maria von Weber, who, who was a, a, a very important figure. Um, in particular, uh, Der Freischutz uh, of 1821 uh, is noted for its characteristic German atmosphere, for its soup for the supernatural, and is actually a masterpiece of eerie suspense and also, actually, a masterpiece of psychological probing, because the supernatural quite clearly does relate to strange movements and dynamics inside several of the characters' minds. So, in many ways, what Wagner wanted to see in his music drama was already being anticipated earlier on. Um, in Paris, grand opera of the 1820s and the 1830s led to the development of massive ensembles of increasingly extended passages of, bro of unbroken music and technological innovations led to tremendous spectacular scenic effects. Here is the famous one. Actually, this stage direction is at the end of La Mouette de Portici uh, says that the, uh, the young girl who is dancing throws herself into the crater of Vesuvius as it erupts. In actuality, as we can see here, that doesn't quite happen. <laughs> this is a fabulous stage direction. I wish it could. Um, but um, now, as a young man, Wagner violently attacked this theatre, with the exception of Weber. He always idolised Weber. Uh, he tells us that uh, uh, when he was young, he used to look out of the window and he used to watch Weber walking to work to the Dresden Opera House. I'm sure he was being sentimental, but it's a nice thought. Um, but anyway, he, he violently attacked the theatre, and he was not prepared to see it as changing. But his criticisms actually, in many ways, did have a point. First, grand opera. He, he talked about grand, grand opera as being nothing but effects. And in fact, grand opera may well have been rather disunified um, from what we can gather from uh, descriptions of grand opera in the 1820s and the 1830s. Um, there's much attention on scenic effect, and perhaps this did work to the detriment of the music. One of the first things Wagner wanted to do was make sure scenery and the music did not sort of conflict with each other for, 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 for attention. Um, he might have been right also in saying in Bel Canto there was too much attention to the voice, even though today we can look at some of Rossini's operas and say, oh yeah, there's some really interesting drama here. If we read of the singers of the time, the, 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 the Judita Pastors, the Maria Malibrands, the who were tremendous sort of uh, performing artists, when you went to the theatre, you clearly, the, 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 you'll find the, the reviews talk entirely about Malibran and, and, and the music comes sort of as an afterthought at the end sometimes. Um, um, in German romantic opera, um, great, there, were, there were great effects in music, but we do know that there were some very low standards of playing and production, and that this in many ways vitiated the, 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 the effectiveness of some of the works that were put on the stage. Um, Wagner's ideal of theatre was essentially to unify all elements of theatre so that they worked as a seamless whole and that one was, to a considerable extent, unaware of the difference between music, words, and scenery. In other words, it is the seamless wholeness which is a crucial element in Wagner's conception of what opera should be, and every performance element should complement the others. He also wanted audiences to pay attention to his work, because it was actually only when works took place with a totally attentive audience that the artists could really concentrate upon bringing all the elements together in this exciting performance. Now, for Wagner himself, how did he begin to approach questions of unifying the theatrical and operatic event prior to the composition of the ring? 
Well, in the 1840s, he wrote three operas, each of which has the same theme, which actually was unique in the operatic history of the time, because these three operas could all be read as being autobiographical. And indeed, even in that time, they were to a certain extent seen as being autobiographical. And up until this point, autobiography was not one of the things we actually did on the operatic stage. But in each of these three operas, we have the predicament of the romantic hero in an unsympathetic society. And these three operas, which Wagner, a little bit later, referred to as music dramas, are actually progressive exercises in developing a continuous flow of music, so that ultimately there will be no pauses in the music for applause, and you've got a sense that the music and the drama worked together in a wholeness. Furthermore, in these three operas, in contrast to other operas that tended to be seen on the stage of the 1820s and 1830s, the orchestra had a heightened presence, and the, orchestra or the orchestration was unusually lush and deep. Uh, there was a sort of a greater richness to a lot of Wagner's words. The first of these three operas, of course, is Death Fleeting for Hollander or The Flying Dutchman, first performed in Dresden in 1843. This is a Byronic romantic work, and it's notable for the way in which the stormy music of the sea and of violence um, articulates the inner world of the two central characters, the Dutchman and Centre. Uh, and all of us, I'm sure, well, all of us are probably familiar with the Flying Dutchman, you all know, you all know that there are passages where we really get the sense of sort of moving into the, the characters and understanding their inner emotional world. But one of the interesting things about the Flying Dutchman is that passages of music drama, which seem to go into the characters, alternate with music that is closer to the style of bel canto. And this actually is put to very canny dramatic effect. Those characters who sing, sing bel canto seem in some ways to be a little bit more conventional, a little bit more archaic, belonging to a previous generation than the characters who sing more in the style of music drama. Uh, the next of these three um, great operas is Tannhäuser, uh, which was uh, first performed at Dresden in 1845. It is the opera that, that, that Wagner rewrote more times than any other, and it was given a, a radical sort of rewriting in, in, for Paris in 1861. Now, Tannhäuser, on the whole, tends to be a little bit more conventional than The Flying Dutchman. It's grand opera, quite in the style of French grand opera, but unlike grand opera, which tended to deal with sort of social issues and political issues and tended to sort of stay on the surface, Wagner dealt with romantic, sexual and religious impulses in Tannhäuser. And in some ways, as several scholars have seen, in Tannhäuser he first began to start exploring modern psychological themes. The other notable thing about Tannhäuser is it has some of the most glorious melodies ever written for the German operatic stage. And it is this, the glorious melody, that really made Tannhäuser into, uh, sort of brought the, 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 the nation, German, German, the German attention to Wagner as a significant composer. And of course, the third of these three operas that made its name is Lohengrin, uh, first performed in 1850. Um, this is the, along with Tannhäuser, this is the other work that made uh, Wagner's name. In fact, in the 1850s, Tannhäuser and Lohengrin were performed all over the German-speaking world. Uh, and I tend to regard Lohengrin actually as being the supreme achievement of grand opera. Um, it's con the continuity of its score, the grandeur and pathos of its melodies um, are, 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 are notable, of course, but there's an ex so it's an extraordinary use of music to create dramatic suspense. But Wagner, more successfully, I think, than any of his French contemporaries, really used music to create a sense of a whole historical environment that of Brabant in the 10th century. But of course, it also has those two characters, Ortrud and Telramund, mm -hmm. whose music begins to anticipate the idiom of music drama. Um, though Lohengrin itself has a balance and a stolidity that, that Wagner would then lose as we move, I, I don't mean that negatively either, but they have a, they have a balance and a stolidity that, that music drama, later music drama, would not have. Now, Wagner wrote these three operas 
jury, or music dramas, because he did use those terms, as I say, a little bit in, in, in looking at retrospectively, they were written during an, a period of extreme tension in Europe. The Europe in the 1820s and 1830s was on the whole a very quiescent society that following the sort of the, 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 the milestone of the French Revolution and then the trauma of the Napoleonic Wars um, in the, sort of the late 1810s, 20s and 30s, Europe was really a very quiescent society that in some ways was living in fear that revolution and Napoleon would break out again. But as we move into the 1840s, one finds that the tensions below the surface of what we call Edomaya society in Europe, that these were really becoming apparent, and, 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 and uh, Germany and, many, and all other European countries were beginning to sort of uh, develop revolutionary forces that were going to eventually, um, uh, once again, uh, shatter the, the false political calm of Europe. And of course, this came in 1848 to 1849. The 1848 revolution was actually, was the first revolution in the history of modern Europe that was driven primarily by ideology. The French Revolution wasn't. The French Revolution was driven much more by, I think, by class conflict. But in fact, the, the, the 1848 revolution was driven both by class, class conflict and by, um, and by ideology. Primarily by a left-wing ideology, and nationalism being one of the was one of the strongest ideologies at this time. We have to remember that in Europe in the 19th century, nationalism was considered a left rather than a, a, a right-wing force. Uh, and of course, um, Dresden, where Wagner was living, was the last of the cities to actually be caught up in the revolution. And the Dresden Revolution took place in May of 1849. It wasn't a particularly violent revolution. It, it only lasted a few days, and it dealt with, it was basically the people of Saxony rose up against the king, and eventually Prussian troops were sent in, ultimately, to re-establish the status quo. Now, Wagner, how, here we have another picture of the, of the, of the revolution, um, uh, how deeply involved Wagner was in the, uh, in the revolution, it is impossible to, to say. However, in the sort of the months and the years leading up to the revolution, he made several revolutionary statements. And we do know that during the time of the Dresden Revolution, he was involved with this gentleman, Mikhail Bakunin, who was um, the greatest anarchist theatre uh, thinker, I beg your pardon, the greatest anarchist the uh, theatre, uh, the great theatrical person too, he was the greatest um, uh, anarchist thinker of the 19th century. He was against government, against authority, and for collective anarchism. He advocated that human beings should live in a society where they can follow the rules of nature. And Bakunin and Wagner were, over the period of the Dresden Revolution, quite closely acquainted with each other. So quite obviously, Wagner was sort of uh, very much associated with the revolutionary forces at this time. Wagner, with the restoration of order in Dresden, Wagner was forced to flee. And if he had been arrested, he could actually have been executed. Uh, not many people were executed throughout the Dresden Revolution, and even those who were arrested and were ringleaders actually were eventually let go. But certainly, for briefly, it looked like Wagner might have been in danger of losing his life. And eventually, he settled in this place. Uh, this is a modern picture of Zurich, but I put it in because it gives you an idea of what a peaceful, calm city this is. Um, and um, uh, 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 I couldn't actually find a good picture of Zurich in the, in the 19th century. Uh, but anyway, um, he, he, he went to Zurich, and here um, he had nothing to do. He had given up his, his position as Kappelmeister in Dresden, so there he was in Zurich, and he was just sort of sitting down, having to contemplate the rest of his life. And he spent the next five years doing just that. He wrote virtually no music. He had very few performance opportunities. He did have a few. He did do some conducting in Zurich, but Zurich did not have a particularly vigorous um, uh, uh, sort of public performance culture at this time. And he had, because he was an exile from Germany, no access to German opera houses at all. 
And so, Wagner v. Wagner, his mind could not stay at rest, and so this was when he sat down and he really contemplated himself and thought out the real implications of what this new theater and this new music was that he envisaged. And he did this uh, first and foremost by writing three major theoretical works. Um, the first of these was written very soon after he arrived in Zurich, Die Kunst und die Revolution, or Art and Revolution. This, I think, is the most accessible of all Wagner's theoretical writings. It actually is quite short, it's very direct, it's very simply written, and it really actually sets out his ideas in very clear and very sort of exhilarating ways. Um, it's written with a simplicity that was brought about by passionate feeling. Probably only took him a few days to write, but this was the opportunity he had in some ways to really sort of start crystallizing his ideas. Um, and I strongly recommend uh, that you read that. It is really worthwhile reading. His argument in De Consul de Revolution was as follows. He said, the history of creative art is a history of decline from one moment in history when all the arts were perfectly fused at the festival of Dionysus in Athens, <laughs> ancient Athens. It is only at the festival of Dionysus that all the arts were free to associate with each other and in doing so, they found total freedom in co collaborating with the other arts. And what they did was they presented humanity with a vision of, and I quote, eternal rhythm and eternal harmony. And he pictured the Festival of Dionysus as the central event of Athenian society. I put in one quote here which I love. The people streaming in its thousands from the state assembly, from the agora, from land, from sea, from camps, from distant parts, <coughs> filled with its 30,000 heads, the auditorium. They came to see the most pregnant of all tragedies, Prometheus, in this titanic masterpiece to see the image of themselves, to read the riddle of their own actions, to fuse their own being and their own communion with that of their God, and thus, in noblest, stillest peace, to live again the life which a brief space of time before they had lived in restless activity and accentuated individuality. I think it's those, the final sort of uh, four or five lines of the important one, to see the image of themselves, to read the riddle of their own actions, to fuse their own being and their communion with that of their God, and then it's in the theater where in a brief, where, 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 uh, where you come and you, uh, in a brief space of time, um, you actually can sit and, and, and listen just to yourself in the noblest, stillest peace to live again the life which a brief space of time before they had lived in restless activity and accentuated in reality. I don't have to give away any, uh, any um, um, secrets here by saying that this was the basic idea behind the festival of the, the Bayreuth Festival. But the important thing about theatre is it establishes identity and community. Theatre makes us aware of ourselves. It establishes a community. Um, it allows us also to see the greater motives and beings behind everyday action. Theatre actually, because of this, helps us forge our freedom. Wagner was highly idealistic about theatre at this time. He says, since the time of the Festival of Dionysus, the arts have declined. They have become fragmented. Each are going their own way. Each go into their own egoisms. And then in a historical sort of account that really is highly questionable, but is an interesting one nonetheless, um, he said that what happens is, is that the, as the arts gradually lost their ability to express the spirit of the community, because they became the agent of authorities and gradually the arts moved from expressing the spirit of the community to expressing the ideology and the, 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 the power of those bodies that ruled um, that society. So he said initially the Christian church used the arts to propagate dogma. 
and then the absolutist monarchs of the 16th, 17th, and 18th century used the theatre as primarily to reflect the glory of their rule, their wealth, and their, 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 their power. And in the modern age, he says, uh, the arts have been given over to commerce. The arts now are merely to entertain, to sell the products of a commercial culture. And he then says, its essence is industry, that's commerce, its essence is industry, its ethical aim, the gaining of gold, its aesthetic purpose, the entertainment of those whose time hangs heavily on their hands. Well, I think it's, um, um, art has lost all power, in fact, Barclay argues, to move and transform society. And behind a lot of this thinking are the thoughts about Hume. Uh, who clearly, in fact, was strongly influencing Wagner at this time, but he saw the arts as being in many ways, sort of the theatre in particular, as a means of trying to find a sense of national identity that would challenge the dominant uh, forces that were, in fact, forming society. The second work um, was published the following year, Die Kunstwerk der Zukunft, or The Artwork of the Future. Uh, this is more of a challenge. Um, it was uh, dedicated to Ludwig Feuerbach, who was one of the major thinkers actually behind the ring. And, and, and next year, I actually, in this, this lecture next year, I think I would talk, talk mainly about uh, Feuerbach and Schopenhauer, who were the two big intellectual uh, thinkers behind the whole ring itself. But Feuerbach was actually a very influential socialist thinker whose ideas are behind a lot of the, uh, of, of, of the 1848 revolution. Uh, and um, actually, he was less revolutionary back than back in the but his ideas did uh, influence the artwork of the future. And in the artwork of the future, Wagner wrote a little bit more about egoisms. He talked about egoisms of art in, uh, in, in, um, uh, in, in Art and Revolution. But he says, when we separate each of the arts, each of the arts loses its capacity to move and loses its power to move and speak to the audience. He said, the arts can only fulfill themselves when they are combined with each other. They find their ultimate potentiality of expression only when they are associated with the other arts. In other words, pictures are much more impressive if they move and if they move to music. Uh, so he, he, he argued that the, the, the separation of the arts in many ways uh, disempowers them. Um, and they find their ultimate potentiality only when combined with each other. And so what he wanted to do in his work well, is to unify all the arts. And this idea of unity is essential to Wagner's idea of theatre. The next, the perhaps most important idea that comes out of the artwork of the future is the concept of the folk or the people, which he defined as being all those who feel a common need. Now, uh, sort of um, generations and generations of scholarship have since actually uh, argued that Wagner primarily sort of evolved much more in the terms of sort of a blood identity. And I, I, I don't want to go into that at the moment, but certainly in uh, the artwork of the future, it was primarily people who felt a common need were basically defining the folk. Um, art expresses the need of the people. It's not just mere entertainment, but it expresses social identity and social need. And hence, from the arts, and in particular, from the theater that Varg was beginning to imagine, it is possible for people to develop a sense of national identity. And although Wagner um, did not develop in these books on the specific issues of German nationalism, his thinking uh, was in fact eventually taken up by a lot of nationalist thinkers. So, the, um, the, 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 the uh, artwork of the future is the second of the works. The third work of, in this list, is, in this series, is by far the most challenging, though it is the most important theoretical work that was ever published by Wagner. It is um, opera and drama, opera und drama. This is book length, it is prolix, it is repetitive, it is highly technical, and parts of uh, opera and drama are only, I think, uh, accessible to the musicologist. But it is a major work, and is one that really repays the effort that it takes to read it. Um, at the start of the book, 
Wagner expresses his, his, his complaints about contemporary opera. Now, he said the real problem is that in contemporary opera, a means of expression to music has been made the end, while the end of expression, the drama, has been made the means. So essentially what he wants to do is to reverse this priority. Now, whether he was right or not is, I think, sort of a matter to be discussed. Um, but at the same time, it is important to understand that this is the way that he saw the world. Now, essentially, he rejected the idea of absolute melody. He engages in a long altercation in this book with the development of what he calls absolute melody, which is embodied by Rossini, in which he claimed Rossini composed with very little attention to the dramatic situation. All he was concerned about was developing the voice and displaying the, 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 the wonderful sort of uh, uh, vocal powers of the singers. Um, he, 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 said, he claimed also that Rossini was concerned to deliver to the audience nothing but beautiful pieces of music. Um, even Weber, uh, Wagner's favorite composer, um, actually um, could not entirely resist the call of absolute melody, um, though um, his music was more German, German and therefore more harmonic, but he actually spoke about Weber's melodies as being long-breathed, joyful, yet plaintive. Now, um, this thinking is important to Wagner as he developed his theory, but I don't think that we should take it as being unquestioningly acceptable, because there were many, there, there was much greater strength in the opera prior to Wagner than he claimed. Uh, even the early Bel Canto operas clearly have a dramatic purpose, but as I said, he was a revolutionary. He needed to declare a state, a corrupt state, that he needed to create his new world from. There are other important aspects to, uh, uh, to uh, opera and drama. The need for a poet. Uh, only the sharp cut word of poetry affords the musician a natural basis for sure infallible expression. He said, Poetry is necessary as a basis for the music that the composer has to compose. And in an interesting analysis, he looks at Mozart's operas and points out that Don Giovanni and Cosi Van Tutti are much more successful than the La Clemenza di Tito because they have librettos that are actually really quite concise, that really define the characters very well, and that really sort of allow us access to the characters. In contrast to Titus, which was written to an old Metastasium libretto, which is sort of much more general and gives generalized emotions rather than, than specific emotions. So it was in particularly Don Giovanni and Cosi Van Tutti, he found the relationship between words and music that he hoped he could be able to create in his own work as well. Um, a constant theme of his work is words and music do not exist in opposition to each other. So the conflict that Richard Strauss develops in that very charming opera, Capriccio, which I imagine some of you saw in the old HG transmission uh, a few weeks ago, that conflict, as far as Barney was concerned, had absolutely no importance, no relevance whatsoever. It wasn't something that even needed to be raised. Words and music were as one. Words and music have an equal value. Um, uh, in fact, they find themselves in each other. Uh, another theme of opera and drama is that he, uh, he, was, he, he attacked the degraded theatre of his time, and again, brings up many of the themes that I've already mentioned. He attacked Rossini for only giving audiences what they wanted. He claimed that in Rossini's works, poor Rossini really got sort of the, was, was, was the whipping boy here, though interestingly enough, the later years when you visit Rossini, they go on very well. Um, but anyway, he claimed that in Rossini's work there was no integrity, no inner necessity to the work. And he attacked grand opera for kleptomania, <laughs> stealing from wherever it could find different sources just to create some melange that, 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 sort of, um, that the audience loved. Uh, he, he said they steal from all cultures and uh, are de devoted mainly to creating effect. Um, again, these statements are very important as they give us access to Wagner. I'm not quite so sure if we should actually take them as being sort of historically valid statements. 
Um, next, there are political aspects to uh, to, to, to um, uh, opera and drama as well. Um, he claims the modern state has placed everyone, and I quote, in regulation livery. I think all of us, to a certain extent, can see the, sort of the, 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 the truth in that. Um, and he says, the contemporary theatre serves the moribund ends of the state, and that human beings in the theatre are seen as merely thought of as ciphers, or as parts of the mass. Hence, the shallow characterization of grand opera and the prominence of the chorus. I must confess, actually, I have a little bit of uh, sympathy with Wagner in this one. I do think, actually, he was right that, in fact, sort of the, the grand opera in particular really did serve state purposes. And to a certain extent, the human was downgraded as a result. He says, in grand opera, mechanism is all that matters, and that the theater should resist this. Um, but one important thing about opera and drama, he does not then go and fall back on the left-wing ideology of his Dresden days. Instead, he allows his own ideas to be much more clearly expressed. And, and, and this is where I think my own sort of approach to looking at the ring often is sort of it, it, is, is more uh, sort of uh, directed toward the, the dramatic and theatrical aspects rather than the purely political aspects because I think ultimately it was the theatre that he really wanted to focus on and that was his ideas rather than political ideology that would get him to the goal that he wanted to get to. Um, there, um, um, he, he talked about individuality, myth and the folk. Theatre must focus upon the purely human must resist the tendency of the state to categorize, and instead it should allow the humanity of the characters to come to the fore. And he said they would, this would be done best by revealing the timeless myths of humanity through the individual experience of the dramatic characters. And this is where I think we get to that important dimension. The timeless myths of humanity that take us back to ancient Greece and beyond yet expressed through the dramatic experience of the characters who are modern characters and how we sense the ancient myth coming alive in the modern characters. Um, the opera drama ends with a highly technical description of the drama of the future and as to how this will be brought around through the combination of words and music. And from this emerge some of the basic principles of the use of the music in the ring. And I'm going to leave that to Jeffrey to talk about, or he'll begin after dinner. Um, I should emphasize that Wagner's literary work, in his intensive literary work, took up the five years after the Dresden Revolution. And um, it was in this time he hardly wrote a single note of music. Um, and as uh, Ernest Newman points out in his great biography of Wagner, a lot of people claim that in fact this is a complete waste of time. He says, no, it was not a waste of time. What happened was, was that Wagner was really, really took the time to rethink everything that he wanted from the theatre, and he began to plot very, very clearly to himself the whole structure upon which the ring of the Nibelung would be constructed. Um, uh, this is, um, uh, it was a necessary fallow period in which he explained the growth of his unprecedented thought, uh, thought on opera and music drama. Because I must admit, although the idea of the seamlessness of the work of art had been around before, it actually goes way back to the 17th century. You'll find people, theorists, writing about, about the Gazant Kunstwerk, the, the wholeness of the work that can be work of art back in the 17th century. But it was Wagner who thought it through. The seamlessness, the way in which it could actually be achieved, is what he thought through in these great works. Um, I think also <coughs> Wagner's decision to just devote his time to writing was an indication of the man's immense self-confidence. There were tremendous pressures upon him to continue to compose in the popular vein of Lohengrin, but he resisted them because this, the ring, was the goal he wanted to achieve. So to summarize the purpose of the new drama, it, it, essentially what it does is, it, uh, this is of, of the ring itself, it should um, realize the, it's a drama of the folk of a people. It should realize the identity of a people rather than just the interests of the wealthier classes. 
He envisioned the stage as being and the, 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 the ring as something that would transform audiences, that would make them new people, aware of a, a much greater richness in human life. He specified myth rather than history. Myth has always been a pretension in Wagner's work. There are mythological elements, obviously, in Dutchman, uh, in, in, in Tannhäuser, and in Lohengrin. But in Dutch, in, in those three operas, on the whole, myth and, 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 and history tended to sort of interrelate with each other. Uh, and, and of course, grand opera, as it was practiced in most European theatres, was actually purely historical. But what Wagner sort of theorized in the course of writing his works is that ultimately myth was by far the most important element in his work. And with the questionable exception of Die Meistersinger von Nürnberg, he actually, the, the, the remainder of his, uh, his, his uh, uh, creative career was devoted to uh, dramatizing and, 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 and embodying myths. Um, music drama, creative art, especially music drama, must be central to the culture. It must have a powerful impact upon the social and political life of its time. In fact, I think never in modern times has art, theatre, and music been assigned such an elevated and powerful position as they were by Wagner. And however much people who, uh, uh, who, who devote their lives to the arts these days might want to distance themselves from Wagner, it was, uh, it was originally Wagner who really, in fact, theorized and made art into the religion of our society. Now, finally, what I'd like to do today is just sort of look, to put, look a little bit more at the specifics of the ring. Because the ring was the work that was going to achieve the vision that Wagner had put forth in these theoretical works. And again, as I say, I think one of the amazing things about, about this is that it was actually successful. Uh, Wagner had immense ambitions for the ring. The sources of the cycle are very various. It's based on sort of uh, various sources, first on uh, Icelandic sagas, in particular the Poetic Edda, the Volsunga Saga, and the Prose Edda. Um, these are Icelandic sagas that sort of deal with sort of um, uh, with, with, with Nordic Europe and the in, in, in the time of sort of, of, of tribal uh, structures. Uh, and then Das Nibelungenlied, the song of the Nibelungs, which was the uh, the, 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 the greatest um, romantic um, a poem of the uh, of the. the um, uh, of the German Middle Ages, and then Vidric's Saga of Bern. These were the various sources that Wagner um, um, uh, uh, drew upon. They were tales of Norse gods, of ancient heroes and villains. It is in these works that Brunhilde, Siegfried, Siegmund, Hagen, and Alberich actually first make their appearance in European culture. But what Wagner did was he did not in any way see himself as actually going out and sort of authentically recreating on the stage the work of the, of the ancient sagas. No, he took whatever he wanted. Talk about kleptomania. Wagner was the biggest kleptomaniac of them all. He went and he got characters that interested him, and he put them together, and he created his own story, which is entirely his own. For example, until this time, nobody associated Wotan and Siegfried. It was Wagner who brought the two figures of Wotan and Siegfried together. Um, so what he did was he wove narrative strands and themes from his work to create his own entirely original drama. I should also point out, by the way, that while today um, most of these works are, are, are fairly distant to us, in Wagner's time they were not. They were, they, they, these works enjoyed great popularity in Germany. They have been translated into modern German and what were widely seen. The mythic and heroic material of these works was actually already being sort of uh, recognized as equivalent to the great myths of ancient Greece. And they were being used by, uh, already when Wagner was beginning to get to work on the ring, they were already being used to develop a growing sense of a unique German national identity. And Wagner, by the way, was not the first to dramatize these tales of the rings. They were dramatized beforehand, and indeed there were one or two operatic adaptations 
before Barnes. Now, I'd just like to finish by talking a little bit about the odd process of composition of the ring. Um, because it, it, it came about in, in quite a sort of a, sort of a, 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 a strange, backward way. Um, he began writing the ring prior to writing the theoretical works. So the idea of the ring actually was in his mind about 1847, 1848, while he was still in Dresden, Kappelmeister of the Opera. And in 1848, he wrote the poem to Siegfried's Tod or Siegfried's Death. Um, and Siegfried, so initially, he, he seemed to take on Siegfried as if he would be another of his young, misunderstood romantic heroes. So it looked as if Siegfried was going to be in, in the line of Dutchman Tannhäuser Lohengrin, uh, a, a, a young man who strived to achieve perfect freedom, but was cut down by the mendacity of the politicized society that he was forced to live in. And so Wagner wrote Siegfried's Tod, but then realized that he had backstory problem. You know, so much had happened before that if he wanted to convey all that material to audiences, he'd have to put in a gigantic amount of exposition. If any of you have read 19th century drama, you'll know 19th century dramatists love exposition. Ibsen, for example, about 95% of any Ibsen play is basically exposition. People going back saying, what the hell happened there in the past? And then only at the very end, sort of moving into the future. But anyway, uh, uh, exposition, he had real problems with that story. And so he decided that, in fact, he is going to have to write a second work in order to explain Siegfried's Toad. And so in 1851, while he was working on opera drama, or actually probably it was soon after opera drama, he wrote poem, the, the poem to Der Junge Siegfried, or The Young Siegfried. And this was an opera on Siegfried's youth. It tells how Siegfried is united with Brunhilde, the daughter of the god Vota. And Siegfried here is full of energy and full of the idealism of revolutionary youth and seems very, very different from the Dutchman Tannhäuser and Lohengrin. So we're moving into a, a different sort of uh, hero here. But at the same time, there were further backstory problems because you had to explain who Brunhilde was. You had to explain who Siegfried's parents were. And so, in the same year, he wrote the poem to Die Valkyra, or the Valkyrie, which deals with the events leading to Siegfried's conception by Siegmund and Sieglinde, and also about how Brunhilde came to be exiled from the domain of the gods. But even that wasn't enough. Actually, on the whole, I think you could do the ring with just Valkyrie, Siegfried, and Goethe Dameron. They do sort of tend to form a story. But, uh, but he wanted, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about why he wanted this tomorrow, he wanted a prologue which in some ways would provide an introduction to this whole work. And so, in 1852, he wrote the poem to Das Rheingold, or The Gold of the Rhine, which is a preliminary evening of, or introduction. And this is the tale of how Wotan failed to pay the giants who built his castle of Valhalla, and the catastrophe that occurred, and we're going to look at that in a lot more detail tomorrow. It also tells how the dwarf Alberic forged a ring that will give absolute power to whoever owned it and at the same time renounced love. After he had, he had finished Das Rheingold, he then went back and he rewrote Der Junge Siegfried and, 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 Goethe De, and, De, and, and Siegfried's Tod, which eventually became Wart and Goethe Demeron, so that in fact there was a sort of a, 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 a unity in the four works. Um, and in doing this, uh, in this rewriting, he tended on the whole to bring Wotan a little bit more into the center of the action uh, than he had been before. And um, he rewrote the ending uh, by which Valhalla is burned by fire and a universal cataclysm. He was never happy with that ending. We'll wait until we get to Goethe Demeron to talk about the different versions of the ending that we have. He, he wrote the libretto backwards, published it, and, and, and then refused to change it, which is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, he published it, uh, and, and, and then he actually read it uh, at a hotel um, in Zurich by the lake. People came along and they listened to the bar, and they going on this, reading this massive libretto over several days. But it, although he wrote the libretto backwards, or the poem backwards, he composed the music in the proper way. Um, oh, there we go, that's how they put it. So uh, here we have the composition of the music, 1853 to 54. He wrote Das Rheingold. Uh, when I say, by the way, five years without music, that is from 1848 to 1853, because he finished Lohengrin in 1848. Um, 
He uh, does Rheingold, 1853 to 1854. Uh, Die Valkyra from 1854 to 1856. And then he wrote Siegfried Act 1 2 in 1857. And then for various reasons, he broke off composition of the ring and then engaged in two just sort of rather slight sort of um, uh, works of, sort of, of whimsy and youth. <laughs> Tristan and Zalda and Die Meistersinger von Nürnberg, uh, which of course took gigantic amounts of his energy, but he returned in 1859 to write Siegfried Act 3, one of the most sort of eruptive, volcanic, lava, flowing lava pack piece of music I know is Siegfried Act 3. It's an astonishing piece, and it's really interesting because there were, there were actually very good reasons why he should give up uh, composing in 1857. He actually was beginning to run out of steam. Uh, with the ring, and therefore he went on to other things, and then when he came back, he came back with an astonishing revive, and this energy never left him until he finished Go Goethe Demmering in 1874. Um, and um, indeed, I think that Siegfried Act III and Goethe Demmering are among his very greatest achievements. Um, Eventually, uh, the performance, the, uh, the, the first performance of Das Reingold took place in 1869 at the Munich Court Theatre. Wagner didn't go, he didn't want it to be done. But Ludwig II, who was actually bankrolling him to write this, got really pissed off with him and said, I want to see the ring. And so, actually, against Wagner's wishes, he went and had the, ri uh, he went and had the ring produced at the Munich Court Theatre. Wagner did not go. People who saw it were rather good. And then, in 1870, Die Valkyra was staged again by the same impatient king. Uh, but, after, but after this, Wagner did not release the information to Ludwig that he had finished Siegfried, because he didn't want Ludwig to get hold of Siegfried, so he managed to keep Siegfried and Goethe Dermot to himself, and then he went ahead, <coughs> built a theatre, which actually fulfilled his ideals in, a, uh, in an architectural way, and I'll be talking about how he did that on, on, on Sunday. Um, and um, the, the, the Ring des Nibelungen was first performed at the Bayreuth Festival Theatre in 1876. And it's important to know this actually because it accounts of strange anomalies in the Ring as a whole. Dramatically, Goethe Demmerum is by far the most old fashioned of the four dramas. It has a very complex plotting, it's a grand opera, it's dependent upon choruses, it has ensemble pieces that Wagner